Welcome to the Homeschool Show from North Carolinians for Home Education. Our goal is to help you homeschool with confidence and joy. I'm your host, Matthew McDill, and we have, again, as our co-host, Rhonda Marshall. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, Hey, how are you doing? Doing good. How about you? I'm good. Great. Well, let me tell you about our show today. We have a really great one planned. Um, First in homeschool news, we'll give you an update on how the um, 2022 Thrive Homeschool Conference went and let you know how you can get a hold of the audio recordings. Very important. And in our homeschool conversations today, we will listen to two segments of a conversation that Matthew had with Andrew Pudua of the, the founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing. And then finally, in our homeschool tip of the week, actually, we got two Couple tips. Couple of tips, yeah, <laughs> two, extra. Two tips. So first, we will talk about some ideas and resources for reading aloud to your children. And then we will talk about the importance of the spiritual growth of mom and dad in the home. Great, thanks. Yeah. We'll head into homeschool news. Can you believe the 22... 22- Conference is over. I know. It was a whirlwind. It was fantastic. It was wonderful. Had such a good time. And I hope many of you were able to be there and were able to enjoy it as well. You know, one of the big highlights for me this year, Rhonda, is the fact that beforehand we were really working hard with our multicultural liaisons, Mm -hmm. TSNs, and LUs to reach as many uh, different kinds of homeschool families as we could to increase our diversity, uh, to reach the new growing populations. Mm-hmm. And so I've asked uh, T. Essence to give us an update, since she couldn't be in here today, mm-hmm. uh, by video on how the conference went and how our multicultural efforts went. So let's uh, listen to T. Essence. So we completed the 2022 Thrive Homeschool Conference, and it was amazing. This was my first year as a multicultural liaison, Um, my third conference with my first one in this position. And I have to admit, I was nervous. I was nervous about um, would we see the fruit of diversity from our work that we've done over this year? And would people feel comfortable when they come to the multicultural workshop and and to connections and, and how would that all go? And I have to say that it was beyond what I could have expected. Um, We had comments from everybody, whether African-American or Chinese, Hispanic, even Caucasians say that this was the most diverse conference they've ever been to. Of course, the standard things were amazing as they always are. The vendors were great. The college fair was great. Um, The speakers were phenomenal. The keynote speakers um, in in sessions were great. Um, My children had a great time in the children's program. My teenage daughter uh, loved the dance. She loved the game night. So all of those things were amazing as they always are. But this year, we saw the fruit of the work that we've been doing multiculturally. And we got to connect with um, moms who have adopted children of different races or um, those who are of African-American descent or those who speak Spanish and even um, a Chinese homeschool leader who's like, yes, I want to be a part of this and and connect more Chinese homeschool families to NCHE. And it was just such a blessing because what we're trying to do here at NCHE is to equip and connect and protect all North Carolina homeschoolers. And so we want to be able to reach people of all different ethnic backgrounds and, and have us all homeschool together in this beautiful unified diversity and that's what we saw at the conference this year so that was amazing definitely even makes me even more excited to continue the work that we're doing and looking forward to next year's conference to all of the new ideas that we have um, the different sessions that we're looking forward to being able to offer and so this conference was definitely um, a good launching pad for all of the possibilities going forward. It was amazing. I'm still kind of on a high from it all. And I am just so looking forward to next year's Thrive Conference. So if you missed it, you really did miss it this year. But go ahead and start preparing for next year. It is always the weekend of Memorial Day. So look at that weekend. Go ahead and block it off and make sure you are at the NCHE Thrive Conference in 2023. See you then. Thanks so much, T. Essence, for that. You did a great job, T. Essence. I'm so proud of Luz and T. Essence and all the work they did. And you and I have worked a lot with them as community uh, relations director and executive director. You know, we put a lot of time with them uh, and also for that. And we're just so proud of what took place. Uh, 
Rhonda, did you have any particular parts of the conference you enjoyed this year? Mm, there's oh, it's always, always so hard to pick. Yeah. But um, I loved. We were working. Mike and I were down in the dance. And yeah. I just w- love watching those teens. I even snapped pictures and sent them to some of my older nice. kids that are married yeah, and yeah. said, you remember this? Yeah, that's great. It was so cool. But I'm just getting to see everybody and right. seeing that you could see the difference in diversity. And mm-hmm. that was a blessing. Such a blessing. One of my favorite parts was, I think, the keynote um, address from Jeff Myers. Oh. So that was Saturday morning. And mm-hmm. uh, I really enjoyed that one. Mm-hmm. I think that was a highlight for me. And that brings up... The other thing I wanted to say, and that is that you have the opportunity to purchase the workshop and keynote recordings from the conference. And so we had amazing speakers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I said, Dr. Jeff Myers. We also had Rebecca Spooner, Mike Donnelly, uh, Derek and Cheryl Carter. Um, We had Dr. Kathy Cook, Rachel Carmen. And uh, and then we had many, many other workshops with lots of other speakers as well. In fact, there's a total of 91 different workshops. Wow. So <clears throat> if you go to nchu.com slash 2022-conference-recordings, you can purchase those for $5 per workshop. Um, we're going to have those links in the show notes as well. And you can also buy the entire conference. The whole shebang. Yeah. <laughs> An MP3 parma- uh, format for $160. So go to the website and check that out. And we're going to be referring to some of those workshops for you uh, as we go along. But it's definitely uh, worth your time to go check that out and make that investment. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go into homeschool conversations now. I had a a great conversation with Andrew Pudua, uh, again, the founder of Institute for Excellence in Writing. And uh, we're going to listen to a portion of that conversation right now where he talks about um, the challenges of teaching writing and the benefits of reading aloud to your kids. So let's listen to that. So why don't we talk a minute about a few writing challenges and and solutions. One of the things I very often hear from younger parents, you know, ones in their late 20s or or early 30s, they have now a school-aged child or a couple, and and they realize so much that they did not learn. Um, And I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times, I I never learned to write. (laughs) I I somehow got by through college, but I have no idea how to teach this. Uh, so that's one thing, is just the, the decline in the teaching of writing in American schools actually began around 1970. Uh, and it's very traceable. There has been a steady decline in the writing of high school graduates for 50 years. So clearly, whatever the schools have been doing um, did not work and is working even less now because so many kids don't read either. Right? I mean, most mm-hmm. kids, given a choice between a screen-based entertainment or recreational reading, well, you know what they choose. So the whole level of literacy is just in decline uh, everywhere, partly because of screen-based technology and the entertainment value that that has. And I'm not an anti-tech person, but I do know, even at home school conventions 20 years ago, you'd see a bunch of kids and they all had their nose in a book. Now you go around and they've mm-hmm. all got a pad or a tablet or a phone. Even the two-year-olds in the stroller have got their finger on the, the thing. And I, you know, I think so. That's another problem. Is this? There's an overall decline of literacy, and it's affecting even people who, you know, want to teach their kids mm-hmm. at home. So they come against. I don't have a method or system. I don't remember how I learned this. And then uh, the third thing that's um, a challenge is, of course, um, finding the balance, if you will, between the progressive idea of teaching writing, which is writing is about self-expression. And that's why you teach children to write. It's, it's an artistic pursuit. It's something, you know, if you just give children paper and opportunity, they will learn this and in the process, you know, discover who they really are. 
you know, I, this is the modern progressive view that's been dominant in the schools. On the other extreme uh, is you have to learn so much grammar that you can fill out every worksheet of every workbook you get for six years. Now can I ask on the, on the progressive view, it, has it come with that, the idea of then there's not a correct, I mean has it gone that far to where, and, and however they express themselves must be accepted as. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, know. that is precisely where the edge of progressive thinking is right now. Okay. And it's even more political, in, and there are some people working in the, that world of both education and linguistics who will make the argument that teaching grammar at all is inherently racist. <laughs> Um, however, if we look at the broad span of many thousands of years of world history, um, you can see a very clear relationship between attentiveness to precision in communication, which grammar enables, and the rise of civilization, and then a falling away from attentiveness mm -hmm. to precision in communication, and the decline of civilization. You know, we think of you need grammar to write well, Truth is, there are a whole lot of people who write very well and have very little knowledge of grammar. They have what you might call inherent grammar mm -hmm. because they were read to sure. as children, they read a lot, they, they have been in a, a rich language environment. Um, so for them, they're just the natural writer. In fact, it, um, being read to out loud is the number one predictor of good writing skills in adults. If I meet an adult who says, you know, I write pretty well, I guess, I think. I mean, I always got A's on my papers, but I don't remember learning to learning. do it. <laughs> I will ask, did one or both of your parents read to you a lot when you were growing up? And I'll tell you, eight times out of ten, they'll sit there and go, yeah, you know, actually, my father read the Reader's Digest every day at dinner. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the couple times where they'll say, no, my parents didn't read, but I was the oldest in the family and I read to my siblings. Because uh, one of the things I've discovered is that when children read silently, there's basically two kinds of kids and not many in the middle. Ones who love to read and ones who don't, right? And the ones who love to read, they read all the time, but they, they read books like they watch movies which means they're reading fast. Mm -hmm. And the books are written to be read yeah. fast, page turner, page turner, yep. end of the book. Oh, I gotta read the next one in the series, mm -hmm. right? And it's all commercially driven, um, which is fine. I mean, it helps them practice their decoding skills or whatnot. <laughs> um, but, but at a certain point, they start reading faster than they could hear what they're reading. And then they do what you or I would do, which is skip words, mm -hmm. skip things, skip, thing, skip a word you don't know. You don't need to know it to get the story. Right. Um, see a whole chunk of a sentence or a paragraph that doesn't look interesting or necessary to the plot. Skip it. Whereas when we take in language through the ear, mm -hmm. we get every word. And if it's something that's well written and well read, we get um, a more elegant, more sophisticated, mm -hmm. complete syntax. And the audio input gives us clues and nuances about the grammar that's contained mm -hmm. in the language. Uh, you know, it's funny, you could say four words in four different ways and it would mean four different things, you know. I love reading out loud for that mm -hmm. reason. And I don't always do it, but sometimes when it's either something I need to understand better or when it's beautiful, there, you know, there's a thing happening here yeah. and you want to experience it all so, the way. Um, um, I've been told that, that, that especially when Homeschooling gets hard, things go mm. bad, it is, you're overwhelmed, whatever. Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Just if, keep reading out loud. Yep. If, because if, it's a simple, <laughs> powerful, effective thing to yeah. do. Yeah. And, you know, you think about um, history. A, a lot of us spent a lot of time looking at pages in textbooks of history, and what percentage of that did we retain? Yeah. Most of the history, in my kids, I'm 90% sure they would all say, I learned most of my history from historical fiction. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of that, mom or dad would be reading out loud to the whole family. Well, why? You know, you could study a textbook that contains facts about the American Revolutionary Period, War for Independence, but when you read Johnny Tremaine, that story locks all those images and names and places and times, it locks it into your memory. That was Andrew Pudua, and I always love talking to him. I think one of the main uh, thoughts that came out of that was read, reading aloud. Yeah. And that was a big claim that the number one indicator of a good writer, writer. would be uh, reading aloud in some point in their history. And so for our homeschool conversations, I mean, our homeschool tip of the week, uh, first tip of the week, right? Uh, we're going to talk about reading aloud, right? Yeah, let's talk about it. So if you're going to read aloud, you need some resources for books, mm -hmm. right? So I wanted to share a few of my favorite ones. So I'm going to let you be my yeah, little model. I would love to. Yeah. <laughs> so Homeschooling the Wholehearted Child, and that's by Sally Clarkson. The book itself is wonderful, but in the back, it has a really great section of suggested books that you could read aloud with your children or just hand off for them to read as well. Mm -hmm. um, also, Honey for Their Child's Heart by mm -hmm. Gladys Hunt. And yeah. she also has Honey for a Teen's Heart. Though that's just a full book that's devoted, divided up by age ranges and types of books. Great resource. Another one, and again, I've collected these over the years. You probably can find them at the library. Um, and some of them may not look like this because I've okay. had them for a Do while. Do you have the older versions? I might have some <laughs> older versions since I've been homeschooling for a while. So the next one is The Book Tree, and that's by Elizabeth McCallum and Jane Scott. Again, like Honey for a Child's Heart, it has a, all different ages broken up mm -hmm. from picture books all the way up onto novels. Great. Um, ch books children's, Children Love by Elizabeth Wilson. Again, that same sort of type of book. And, of course, I can always think I can't have enough. So, anyway, so that's why I have quite a pile of them. <laughs> and then also, this is a relatively new one. This is called The Read Aloud Family, and it's by Sarah McKenzie. And some of you may have heard about her. She has mm -hmm. a podcast and a website called The Read Aloud Revival. And she even has mm -hmm. free book lists on her website. So those are some resources for reading aloud. Great. And now let's talk about why is it hard to read aloud? Or was mm -hmm. I the only person that found it hard? Because... Mm -hmm. I did a talk at the conference, um, like lessons learned along the way. I right. said I could be mistakes along the way, yeah, right. <laughs> things I messed up. And one thing I wish I would have done more is read aloud. So I think one of the reasons it's hard is that we overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. And we also have a certain picture in our mind of what it should look like. Like we should have 30 minutes of all the kids all snuggled up against mm -hmm. us and it's all calm and peaceful. And it can be frustrating because most of the time it's not like that. Or it wasn't at my right. house. Mm -hmm. Is it like that at your house? No. Sometimes it is, but not <laughs> always. So I want to give you some tip tips for setting yourself up for success. And your goal is just to make it a habit. The more you do it, the easier it will get. Okay. The more you um, put it in your schedule. So even, even if it's just 10 minutes a day a few times a week, it really adds up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be every day. I think that's part of it that was... I felt like it had to be every day, but even it's you're adding up the time mm -hmm. all through the week. Right. Also, connect your read aloud time to staples of your day, like breakfast time or lunch time, or maybe rest time, um, or maybe at night if dad wants to do mm -hmm. it. So, if you can connect it to something you're going to be doing and just make it a natural part of it, I think it will help. I think earlier in the day, at least for me, is better just because I know I've checked that box and gotten it done. Also, realize that audiobooks are good for, for this, too. Um, or ch your child can read aloud to the family, and they're reinforcing right. their reading sure. skills mm -hmm. in the same way. And also, take advantage of a captive audience when you're traveling. Oh, yeah. Um, and in not just the long <clears throat> rides. Oftentimes, we're commuting to go to lessons or games or something like that. So use that. I know we did, like, Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe on audio right. in the car. Great things to do that. Also, it doesn't have to be heavy novels. <laughs> Lighter books count, mm -hmm. not just the classics. So, like, I remember being 
mesmerized by the Boxcar Children, Little mm-hmm. House on the Prairie, Nancy Drew, right. Trixie Belden when I was a kid, or the Hardy Boys. Also, let them do things while you're reading aloud. Don't expect them to be still, perfectly still. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I always thought that I had to. But Legos, they can get those sticker books that you can, Osborne sticker books. They can work with silly putty or clay or crochet. Just do something with their hands. And keep a basket or a space where all your things are easily accessible. Mm-hmm. They're hands-on things and your book. And don't be tied to one location. Go outside, spread a blanket, have it outside when it's nice. Go to the dining table, the sofa, gather them all around and add food. (laughs) So even something as simple as popcorn can make it fun for Mm -hmm. your kids. A friend of mine does hers in the afternoon and she calls it tea time. And so they have tea and little snacks. It's just fun. But most of all, keep doing it, even if it's noisy and messy and chaotic. And not what you'd like it to be. It still works, even when the kids are grumbling, complaining, fighting, and it doesn't, they don't even seem to be listening. (laughs) Um, It still works. So, in spite of the fact that it looks much different than you initially had a vision for, keep stepping out in faith. And I would encourage dads, just like you said, to do that. Um, I'm currently reading a Lamplighter book in the evening. Uh, The Lamplighter books. And the YWAM books are two of my Ooh, wife's really favorite those are series really for read-alouds. Um, but like you said, in the evening, uh, that's something I can do kind of a before bedtime or one of our family right. activities. We don't do it every day. But hopefully if you get a good book, too, eventually the kids are like, hey, we got to find out what's going yes, on. You and hook the em. power of the story does work. Yes. But like you said, they love to color and play and do other things while they're listening. And we should let them do that. Yeah. I know for sure. Absolutely. So one of the great things uh, as we talk about the IEW Institute for Excellence in Writing is we have a special offer for members of North Carolinians for Home Education. And that is that Andrew Pudua on July 23rd is going to do two live online classes. One of them is introductory writing and another is advanced writing. And if you're a member of NCHE, you can sign up for that. It's exclusive for members of, our, of, of state organizations like ours. Now, if you're not a member, then you can go join by going to nche.com slash join. You can join and your confirmation email will have the link so you can sign up for those classes. If you're already a member, you'll be receiving an email from Briggs Greenwood this month with a link so that you can participate in that class as well. What a great offer. For sure. That's right. So um, now let's move into our homeschool conversation part two. Let's listen to another portion of Matthew's conversation with Andrew. Yeah. What are we trying to cultivate in this family? And, and that's a conversation mom and dad have to have. Mm. And then you can filter everything through that objective. Um, y- you, you decide, do you want this picture on the wall or not? Well, is having this picture in our corporate culture going to help grow those things which we're trying to grow? Love of God, love of neighbor, compassion, selflessness, um, purity, you know, name your, make your list, make your list. And then you can say, okay, is this music that we're bringing in, is that going to help grow what we want to grow? This curriculum that we are looking at, is this going to grow what we're going to grow? Um, is this activity, you know, debate, musical theater, you know, is that going to help grow what we're trying to grow? And if the answer is yes, well then, your decision becomes much easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it's just a financial one, right? If the answer is no, it, it actually probably won't. Well, then your decision is even easier and doesn't involve any finances. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where dad, you know, kind of the executive of the family, the buck stops with dad. And mom has to do everything to make it all work. But the direction and the decisions upon which her decisions are based. I think in a properly ordered family, uh, that's what God gave to fathers. Um, But it's hard. And in some cases, you know, dads are checked out and moms have to do both jobs. Um, In some cases, dads get really authoritarian and want to micromanage everybody and 
that often ends up with kids just, you know, Rejecting running away as soon thing. as they yeah. can, and then hating hating the faith. You yeah. know, so you know, it's 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 always about you. Homeschooling is always about yourself, not about your kids. And if you're in good condition, right? And if you have on the, you know, the armor and take up the shield and wield the sword uh, of the spirit, you can fight off, so to speak, um, those um, forces that would like to harm or even destroy your family. Um, so your spiritual condition, that's tops. There's nothing more important in a family mm. than the spiritual condition of the parents, with the dad being first, I would say. There's always going to be things that threaten our faith, that threaten our commitment, that, that cause us to wonder or doubt. So we have to live conversion. And that means, well, as you're doing, committing scripture to memory, write it on your heart and you've got it. Um, and, and then, you know, in that example, um, your children see. That, and that's, that's infinitely more valuable than mm. any talking you could do. Mm. <laughs> There's actually, I'm not a fan of country western music in general, but there is a particularly good song in one of the verses. The whole song is about, I saw my daddy do it, right? And there's one verse where he sees his father on his knees mm. in prayer and how that that was the thing that really made him realize his dad was real. Wow, that was uh, really powerful. Yes. Uh, that one quote, there's nothing more important in a family than the spiritual condition of the parents. Yeah. And with so the emphasis true. on dad, I hope we'll um, have a thought this week about our spiritual condition and our walk with Christ. We're so glad that you can be with us. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback by emailing us at the homeschool show at nche.com. And I uh, hope you'll join us next week. And until then, continue to homeschool with confidence and joy.